All right. Good morning, students. This is the uh, high school Bible study, uh, and we are progressing along uh, with uh, our study of First Peter. Uh, today, uh, I have uh, with me Chris O. Uh, say hi, Chris. Hi. <laughs> Uh, Chris, what do you um uh what do you do at our church? How do you serve? Uh, I'm one of the leaders for Light Salts, also a glow uh, teacher for the sixth graders, and just help out whenever wherever I can. Yeah. Um. Uh, what have you been? Um. How have you been uh, coping with this uh, coronavirus and <laughs> being at home and stuff like that? Um. So I'm a teacher. So I've been working every day, hmm. uh, but that hasn't been too bad. Um, no, I try to maintain structure uh, since the quarantine started. So I've just been working a lot, exercising a lot, hmm. binging on Netflix a lot, <laughs> uh, uh, sleeping a lot, so yeah. reading a lot. Reading oh, a no. lot. nice. Any? Uh, what have you been reading? social media books <laughs> <laughs> and articles and um, a book mm. yeah book I'm reading a book too and then try to read the bible too because mm. that's important yes that is important let me um, let me read this uh, 1 Peter uh, 3 13 through 22 we left off uh, after chapter 12 and we're just going to finish the rest of, of of the chapter here let me read it and then we'll pray alright let me read Verse 13, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteousness for the unrighteous, uh, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they were formerly and did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Amen. Uh, let me pray. Father, we give you this text. Uh, we give you um, just all of it, Lord. Uh, may this be worthwhile for us and for our students. Uh, may it help us uh, spiritually nourish us through this, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Uh, Peter is uh, basically continuing on with his general instructions for honorable conduct. And so that's the thing that must be couch couched in all of, of, of last week and the previous and even this week, it is honorable conduct. How do we live honorably amongst um, unbelievers? And in this, in specific to this situation, is how do you live uh, honorably when um, during persecution? Uh, let me recap some of the main points from last week because it, it it leads straight into this. If you look at First Peter three verse eight. The main thing uh, from verse 8 is to have brotherly love, right? We got the word Philadelphia uh, from this word, or from here. Brotherly love. That is the main idea of verse 8. Have brotherly love for fellow believers. So people within the church, look at them as your own family. And then verse 9, but what about those people outside the church? And then so uh, Peter says, oh, that should be verse 9. Um, Peter says, don't repay evil for evil. So evil for evil. Don't do this, but bless people. Um, and so even those who hurt you, bless them. 
uh, care about them, pray for them. And that's the idea. And then in verses 10 uh, through 12, it's, it's why should we do that? Is because God favors the righteous and those who do right um, and, and not uh, the ones who do evil. And so uh, that is what Peter was talking about here. So now in our section for this week, Peter continues with this line of, of, of thinking. Uh, look in verse 13. Uh, it says, it begins with the word now uh, in verse 13. But this is better understood as, as therefore. Uh, and so given the fact that God favors the righteous, given the fact that God is against the wicked, Peter uh, in 13, therefore, who's going to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? You see what Peter is saying. Uh, since God favors the righteous, if you do good, uh, and if you are continually striving to do good, then who can be against you? Uh, this is a rhetorical question, right? The, the, the applied answer is no one. No one will, will, will harm you. Um, but against the context of this letter, um, this question doesn't make any sense. Uh, as I pointed out, this, this, this letter was written to persecuted Christians. And so when Peter's like, who will be there to harm you? Well, there's a lot of people harming them right now, uh, whether physically or, or mentally or, or on the reputation or whatever. And so we got to understand what, what, is he, what, what is Peter saying in all of this? Uh, and so, first of all, Peter is not saying that, he, that, 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 that believing Christians will never endure rejection or harm in this world. That is unrealistic. Uh, that's one. Uh, rather, I think he was being a little bit more practical. Peter was saying, if you um, have brotherly love for fellow believers, if you don't repay evil for evil, if you don't lie, do good, seek peace. If you, if you have your Bibles open, students, that's verses 8, 9, and, uh, uh, and 10 and 11. So if you act honorably, then it is less likely that other people will hate on you. And I think Peter is giving practical instructions here uh, with this. Do good, act nice, and less people will hate on you. Now, and I think this is true of like the drama that happens in our modern lives, right? Um, think about it. If you're, if you're a nice person who gets along with others, who is kind and compassionate and forgiving, who doesn't, who doesn't lie, who doesn't speak crap about uh, uh, others, then people will, will like you. But then, you know, those other people that are involved in drama, well, they're not very nice. They, they don't get along well with people. They're not very forgiving. They, they sometimes lie and they sometimes speak crap about other people. Then, then those people are usually involved in, in the drama. And I think it's like a practical, I think it's like very practical as we can apply this. Chris, um, tell me about like your high school days. Like where'd you go to high school? Uh, I graduated from Frederick High School. Okay. Um, in Frederick, Maryland. Frederick right. County. Okay. Um, I graduated in 2012. Um, so. Were there Asian people? In <laughs> uh, honestly, not a lot. I okay. Mean, our school still boasted diversity. Okay. Um, a lot of, still majority white, right? But um, we, we had a high of Hispanic population. Okay. Um, we had a lot of Burmese refugees. Uh, um, how, um, how, many, how many students? How big is your school? It's pretty big, uh, right? At Frederick's school. Always... Oh, it's still, oh, it's 3A. Okay, it's not 4A. No, 3A. Uh, so I think okay. it's like a mid-sized school, something like that. You don't seem like a drama-filled person. <laughs> Were you <laughs> in your younger days? Um, so for the most part, I wasn't. Um, I hate conflict. Mm. I don't know how to deal with it. I'm very mm. terrible at dealing with it. Um, but that's not to say I've never experienced it. Right. Like in high school. Right. Um, you know, I, th I think a lot of the dramas that I've experienced were due to my or my friend's pettiness. Mm. Um, but I can remember one major dramatic experience mm -hmm. um, that got me into a lot of social trouble. Um, and, and one story that I thought of that I repressed for a very long time, but now bring it to the light. Um, so I'll share it. Um, so it was senior year, mm. right? And it was promposal season. <laughs> <laughs> and I had this elaborate plan uh, set up to ask one of the, the prettiest girls at my school at the time 
to prom, right? Uh, and the thing is, you know, I wasn't particularly like good friends with her. Mm. Uh, we we're more like close acquaintances, if that's a thing. Um, and we had a lot of like mutual friends. We participated in the same activities. She played soccer. I played soccer. Mm. Uh, she was in third block lunch. I was in third block lunch. She <laughs> was in tech theater class. I was in tech theater class. She was real smart. She was like brain smart, academic, all that. I was just mediocre. Uh, but anyways, um, you know, I created this like cute like promposal video, uh-huh. with, like One Direction playing in the background. <laughs> and the day that I proposed, um, I snuck out of the school with some friends. Uh-huh. Uh, to buy flowers. Right? Uh, came back to school, hid behind our school auditorium's um, what's it called projector screen, hmm. um, and then waited until this girl came. And then once she came, uh, the video started playing, uh, and I popped out from the back with flowers, and then and then I you know, prom posed to her. Yeah, right? yeah. And, like, and then like like half the school was there, and they're all cheering, and uh, you know I had this. I now had this like reputation that um, of that guy of being that Asian guy uh-huh. who, got the, who got the one of the prettiest white girls in, uh, as a prom date. Uh huh. So, you know, I, I was definitely riding this like social high, right? Until until um, I think about a week a week later. Oh man! I broke off the prom <laughs> engagement. Why did you? Why? So I no longer want to go with her. Uh oh. Um, because uh, I wanted to go with someone else. Oh. Right? Mm. And, but I was also super, super um, insecure mm. of the fact that you know, she wouldn't enjoy um, hanging out with my group of friends mm-hmm. <laughs> that I wanted to go with, go to prom with, right? Mm. Um, instead of like the group of friends that she normally hangs out with. Mm. Uh, so yeah, I pretty much, I dumped her and then asked uh, a different girl. Oh man. So yeah, so needless to say, uh, I, I got so much, <laughs> so much crap and hate from my, my, my close friends at the time, uh, from her friends, from a lot of people. Yeah, uh, and yeah. Rightfully so, it makes sense. Right? Yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, and it took like the entire summer, maybe even longer, to like kind of clear the air. Oh man, you know, oh right man, oh you know, man. Like, apologize. Like, oh you know, man. Um, oh man! Yeah, that's like that's history. Yeah. No, I think um, no. Oh, <laughs> thank you for sharing. That's uh, so one of the better <laughs> stories I've heard uh while doing this. I think um, I think you agree. It's just like, like when you're an agitating person, you know, I'm not talking about like irritable. When you agitate through lying or through not forgiving or through not getting along with others or like whatever like that then you should expect some hate, right? Like, like even in your story, if you, if you just asked out the other girl or asked the other girl to prom, then nothing would have happened, right? Um, but then, like, um, going through this kind of stuff uh, or, or doing, um, you know, speaking lies or speaking ill of others or, or whatever, when you agitate the, the whole social structure of it, you're going to get hate. Uh, you know, and I think I think that's what Peter is saying here. He's giving you timeless, giving us timeless and practical instructions that um, if you do this, uh, it won't come to you for the most part. Uh, um, hate and harm won't come to you. And I say for the most part because um, verse fourteen, he he couches this in in in, in realism. Uh, look at verse fourteen. It says, "But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed." Uh, that means um, acting honorably will keep you out of trouble, right? For righteousness sake, it'll keep you out of trouble for the most part. But even if you should suffer for being honorable, that's okay. Why? Because you will be blessed. This is our ultimate uh, ending in, 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 in Jesus. Uh, through this verse, I think we're all reminded that our ultimate blessing comes from from Jesus and his return. This is why we have we have hope. This is why we believe because we believe that our life is not the end in death. Um, and I think students that you need to have a realistic understanding of life. Uh, we have this 
movie driven fairy tale notion that 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 all good deeds should be rewarded that all bad deeds should be punished that maximum effort will result in in some type of accomplishment or achievement that the best team wins that that the good guys will be rewarded that that good triumphs over evil and that love is is the only thing we need but that that that's not real life uh, sometimes um, the undeserving gets the prize. Sometimes cheaters win. Sometimes the evil beats good. And sometimes believing and faithful Christians will suffer harm. Um, but in those times, <clears throat> that's why Peter's saying, but even if you do, you'll be blessed. Um, this is your ultimate goal. You will be, you will be blessed um, because of God. Uh, Chris, like, I think this is a hard teaching. You know, I think this is a hard teaching and a hard reality for believers to understand. Uh, do you have trouble like living for heaven? That it that is heaven and God and Jesus and his return is the ultimate um, thing in life. Like you, you have trouble with that? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, I think if you just even look at current events today, right? Mm -hmm. And all the things that are going on right now. And then that just leaves me feeling hopeless. And all the things that you mentioned about like how... A lot of people, including myself, I had this like unrealistic expectation of life, um, yeah. and that's not true, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And we're waiting on uh, Jesus' return, right, mm -hmm. for the believers. So, um, you know, when I first like thought about this question and tried to answer it, it was definitely like a yes and no kind of mm -hmm. question for me. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, some seasons like I am um, like on spiritual fire, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. and I don't have too much trouble like living out for God in his kingdom and just trying to try to encourage others to do the same right but then there's also other seasons in life where I definitely struggle um, to live for heaven um, you know the struggle against myself just sin right if you get being so sinful still uh, you know it's a struggle against instant gratification yes. battle against selfishness lustful desires mm. apathy cynicism uh, you know, wanting to be accepted and loved, um, those are all the things like I, I, I still struggle with too. Um, mm. Mm. So yeah. yeah, I think the hardest part is just like battling against my own selfishness and my sinful desires, right? Yeah, yeah. I think um, I think that's that's kind of the realistic picture that Peter is painting here. Take it all uh, together, verse thirteen and fourteen. Act honorably, and for the most part, drama, harm won't come to you, but Verse 14, if you, even if you act honorably and harm still comes to you, comfort yourself in knowing uh, that you, uh, you, uh, you'll be blessed. At the end, in the end, you'll be blessed. This echoes um, Jesus' teaching in Matthew 5.10. I have for you guys here. Blessed are those who are persecuted. right? For what? For righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For they will be entered into heaven. And so that's... That's that. Students, this is why we study about the end times and about heaven. Because that is our ultimate goal and that is our hope. Um, that stop trying to make the best out of this life. Because the best things will come in the next life. And then that we are comforted in that. And so Peter ends verse 14. Uh, Have no fear of them. That's the persecutors. Or be just troubled in general. Uh, because you'll be blessed. And then Peter moves on. Um, verse 15. But in your hearts, uh, honor Christ as holy. Honoring Christ as holy means to set God as number one in your life. Remember this holy word. Uh, it is uh, none other, right? Um, that's the idea, uh, that there's nothing like God. And then so when you set God as nothing like anything else in your life, in your heart, that means God is number one. Peter is saying, don't fear suffering. Don't be troubled by what man can do to you. Instead, honor and revere God. You could even go so far as to say, as, 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 as Peter is saying, um, fear God above everything else. This reflects the first commandment. God must take top priority of your life. And, 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 and what does God want you to do in you as he is top priority? Verse 15 continues. Um, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. 
This situation that Peter paints in this verse is an example of how Christians are to engage the, to engage the world. In our hearts, obviously, we, he said it, we should honor God as top priority in, in our life. And when we do that, when we act honorably in every circumstance, we will treat fellow believers as true family and neutral non-believers with kindness. And we will treat oppressive and mean non-believers with compassion. We, that's what we just talked about, right? And so when we do that, uh, specifically that last part about treating oppressive and mean non-believers with compassion, um, some other people will take note. They'll see our good conduct. Uh, and then they'll ask why. They'll like, why are you so nice? Why are you not 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 hitting back? Why are you turning the other cheek? And like, what is what is driving you? What is your hope, right? And is this moment uh, that we must be prepared to make a defense? This is um, this is where we get the word apologetics from. This defense. Uh, one commentator describes a defense as solid intellectual grounds for believing the Bible. Students, them. This is this is one of my biggest aims for our ministry. You all are smart kids. Uh, and you do well in school, and then um, I, I know that 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 you're not you're not fooled by people who pretend like they know what they're talking about or whatever. Well, guess what? People are gonna do the same thing to you. Not only be smart in school, but also be smart in church. You need to know what you're talking about. You need to know what you believe. You know, know it enough. Maybe not to like a pastor's level, but intellectually be able to articulate exactly what you believe. As you grow older, you'll find and interact, especially your generation. Your generation is going to interact a lot with atheists. And they have this sense of uh, intellectual arrogance about them because the reason is their God. And the reason um, that, that they think they're smarter than us because um, they can make an intellectual argument against uh, the reality of God. Guess what? We have an intellectual argument too. And Peter in this verse is calling us to sharpen ourselves, be prepared to make a defense. Um, and then so who asks you for a reason, uh, for, for logical reasoning, for the hope that is in you. We don't just do nice things because we're nice people or do all these things because our hope is rooted uh, in the gospel and we're actually living it out. Uh, Chris, um, since you are older and that you are, um, you know, working and stuff, do you frequently interact with non-believers? Yeah, um, I do on a daily basis, pretty much. Um, as a teacher, uh, I know that like many of my students are not believers. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I am in the school building, uh, I know a lot of my coworkers also, they practice different religions or, right. um, atheism right. or there are also other Christians out there, but to what extent i'm not sure right so i interact with all different kinds of people <laughs> as um you know as, as you participate in our, our ministry uh or at church at bethel and, and growing up in church like uh, you think you can or you're able to present the gospel in, in a coherent and, and and logical way um okay. as i was preparing to answer this question <laughs> i was like honest with myself like tell myself Probably not coherently mm. at this very moment, mm. but for the purposes of this video, I did come prepared, so I can share a little <laughs> if you want me to. I, uh, no, I, I ask you, I think, because, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's hard, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Yeah. What, 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 uh, why, why do you think it's hard? What aspect is hard when you, like, describe, like, you go to church? Why do you go to church? You know, like, or, like, you go on Fridays? Like, you know, like, why do you waste time like that? Like... Like what, how do you, uh, what makes it so hard, I guess? Not how do you say it? Um, it's definitely kind of touched upon this, like in the previous questions, it's mm. just like when you're so selfish and self-absorbed mm. and you're like, you know, you're still fighting against yourself and your sins, but you're also fighting to, uh, believe mm. in God and truly preach the gospel to yourself. And while that, all that is happening, um, for me personally, it can leave me very like exhausted, <laughs> and then out of like it can be out of laziness that you know I don't take the time or effort to really think or prepare uh, 
Yeah. My defense, so defense of what I really believe in and which yeah. I genuinely do. But now yeah. it's a matter of, all right, now it's time to articulate that. Yeah. To, especially for non-believers, right? Yeah. Um, as well as fellow believers who need to be reminded of uh, the truth and you know, the gospel. So. Yeah. How do you, um, how do you sharpen yourself? How do you like, cause it's like a, it's like a muscle, right? It's like working out and stuff like, yeah. yeah and so it's um, always being prepared. How do you prepare yourself? You think? I think first thing you got, I gotta ask myself if I truly believe in it. <laughs> and that's like, true. It's like essential. You gotta like, do you really believe in it? You know? And, um, are you being transformed by it? Right. Mm. Um, you know, are you being changed by it? Um, and I think, you know, if you don't question yourself for that or don't really know why for yourself, then I think mm-hmm. it makes it that much harder mm-hmm. to even, like, present mm-hmm. the gospel. Um, mm-hmm. And then, you know, just another way of sharpening, I think it's just sharing, um, mm-hmm. just practicing the act of sharing the gospel with your friends, believers, non-believers alike, um, and just being intentional about that. Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, make those mistakes, um, because it's okay, and then grow from it. And after mm. you make the it doesn't end there, right? Like you have to continuously like question yourself and reflect on yourself, and then in mm. that sense, learn to be more prepared. Yeah. Next. No, Chris, that's excellent. I mean, you could go a variety of ways into answering how you sharpen yourself, but I, I think you 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 touched on two great things. One is is passion. Um, you know, people people can um. People can sense if you don't really believe it, right? You know, um, there's, you know, sayings like, don't trust the skinny chef. Why? Because <laughs> they should be eating all the time, right? Like, yeah. w- w- when a salesman comes to you, you can kind of tell, or they're really good at lying that, that like, oh, they really believe in this product or whatever. You know, if you go to the gym and, and you have a personal trainer and they're kind of sloppy, you're just like, wait, wait a minute. Like, why are you telling me how to do this when you're not, like, stacked yourself? Like, that's the passion. It's, it's that I believe in this, too. Um, I believe in, in all this and this has transformed me. And then, and then that, that speaks itself. And then, two is practice. You talked about just, just sharing. And, and I think um, sharing in church to other believers, that's a safe space to practice than to articulate from um, being on the spot to our thoughts and to whatever because, um, you know, we're ready. Uh, you know, I'll be honest, like, sometimes, like, I shy away from this, too, uh, because, um, like, I'm lazy, you know. I, I, I should get to know my neighbors more. I don't. <laughs> you know, like, I'm talking all the time. Like, today, I, I've been talking for about two straight hours. This is because of the two Bible studies and stuff, and I just don't want to talk anymore, but... Um, I don't. Know, I guess I'm confessing my sins. That it's just like I'm not living this out too. We got to be prepared. We got to make a defense. Um, Peter goes on. He just doesn't says to do it willy nilly and how to do it. He gives a little bit more instruction on how to make this defense, this presentation of the gospel. Uh, he does two characteristics. One uh, is is uh, gentleness and respect. This is one, not two. Um, you got to do it with kindness. Remember, the objective isn't to be like, see, you're an idiot. You don't know. Uh, I know, and let me teach you. It's not that. Our main objective is to win them to Christ. It's not to win the argument. It's to win them to Christ. And so, therefore, obviously, with gentleness and respect, uh, we have to do this kindness and, and, and consideration. And then, two, the second aspect is in verse 16. It says, uh, having a good conscience. That's the other way in which we are to make a, a, a defense, is to do it with a good conscience. The dictionary defines conscience as uh, an inner feeling or an inner voice. Um, uh, it's kind of like you know what you should do, right and wrong kind of thing. And so this conscience is this inner uh, moral voice telling us about right or wrong in, in our behavior. But for the believer, that inner voice is the Holy Spirit uh, who dwells within them. And thus, uh, a good conscience is referred uh, to good conduct. The point that Peter is making, it, it seems obvious, right? Um, when, when you do a bad thing, um, then people aren't going to respect you for it, in regardless of whatever's coming out of your mouth. Uh, and so, 
Um, so when you make a gospel presentation, do it with uh, gentleness and, and respect, but also do it from a good reputation. <laughs> do it from um, uh, that, that people respect you as a, as a good person. And, and that's why um, people are going to listen to you. And, and, and in all of that, Peter concludes, uh, verse 17, For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. And, and this is it. One of the points that Peter's making in this whole section is that um, suffering is not an indicator of, of, of a bad thing, right? Um, it, it, like when we are in pain, our body is trying to tell us that something's wrong. So we take the same thing. We think suffering means, oh, God is might be punishing us or we did something wrong. And, and Peter's saying, no, suffering is not automatically, it can happen that way, but it's not automatically all the time about the divine displeasure. The suffering sometimes is just, that's what our lives and God's plan was. And to prove his point, that suffering sometimes is, is, is better than not suffering, he points to Jesus and he cites Jesus. Why is it better <clears throat> to suffer for doing good than for doing evil? It's because Jesus' life is all about that. And look at uh, the final five verses. I have for you here. Let me read. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteousness for the, for un, for the unrighteous, that he might bring us uh, to God, being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Um, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Students, I'm going to skip a lot of this because this is one of the most confusing passages of the entire Bible. I remember one of my seminary professors, he went to a conference and, and um, some, I don't know, it's such a pastor thing to do. They were like, name a passage that's the most difficult in the Bible and you get this prize, right? It was like a free book. And then my professor was like, there's only one answer to this. And it is this question, specifically um, 1 Peter chapter 3, 19 and 20. Um, Martin Luther calls it perhaps maybe the most confusing part about the Bible. And so uh, I'm not going to try to explain this because I'm still a little bit confused on what it says. However, however, uh, we can still understand a couple of things. One, notice that... Jesus' suffering was unjust, right? It says the righteous for the unrighteous. Um, he's, he was suffering for the unjust. His righteous status for uh, the unrighteousness of us. He who knew no sin paid the price of sin so that the point of Jesus' suffering is that he might bring us to God. That's the point. His suffering had a purpose which was to save us and to bring us to God. And, and Christ's atonement is represented in our baptism. Um, students, this is, this is the man that we follow, uh, that he suffered his righteousness for our unrighteousness, that he might bring us to God. And so um, modeling ourselves after Jesus, uh, we do things, um, you know, we do things, uh, for the sake of others. And we do it selflessly. I think that's one. And two, he talks about baptism here. Notice the various aspect of baptism, which includes confirmation and all that stuff in this section. Um, baptism, it's not a removal of dirt. It's not just an external thing, right? Um, but it's an appeal. Appeal here is uh, better understood as a pledge. Um, the, the better translated uh, as pledge. And so baptism confirmation is a public pledge of commitment uh, to God that um, you will have a good conscience, that you will believe in him. Uh, and so um, this is, is what baptism means, uh, that you're committing to him. I've likened baptism to wedding before. It's... Um, 
At your wedding day, you are publicly declaring your commitment to your wife or to your husband. And, and, and baptism is basically the same thing. Chris, do you remember? Uh, where, where were you baptized? Do you remember? Um, so I went through infant baptism. Okay. Um, where? Uh, it's Hemion. Presbyterian Church. Oh, oh wow. Germantown, Germantown, okay. Germantown, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's where um, I kind of grew up going to church with yeah. my family. Yeah. Um, and then I got confirmed uh, fall of 2014 at Bethel. Okay. Okay. Wow. Um, uh, do you remember anything in particular about, obviously not the ceremony because you're an infant, but uh, about like your confirmation, confirmation. and, and, and yeah, the whole process? To be, not, to be honest, like, nothing too, like, <laughs> exciting at the <laughs> time. But, like, it was pretty traditional Bethel confirmation with yeah. E.T. You go yeah. up the stage, and then yeah. he asks you questions. Uh, you know, you're, he's, he's, like, reciting all the vows, and then would you say yes or no, right? Yeah. Everyone says yes, though. <laughs> if you have to. <laughs> That's the answer, right? Yeah. Secret answer. You have to say yes. Yeah. So, um, but I do remember, like, some of the feelings that I had. Mm. I definitely felt, like, Definitely nervous, just because I'm like up there in front of all these people. Yeah. Uh, but also like pretty empowered. Um, yeah. Because you know, like you said, it is a like a, a pledge to God. Mm. Right? Um, and yeah, I definitely felt like excited, happy, mm. enthusiastic. Mm. Um, and then just like as I'm like also reflecting back on like that season of life, I learned a lot too. Just like mm. a lot of things, even afterwards, you, know, you still suffer, right? Yeah. <laughs> so nothing changes. Um, yeah. Other than the fact that you made this pledge to God, um, and you're living out for His glory. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Uh, I think. Um, um, no. Thank you for sharing. It's um, that's what it is, folks. It's it, it, you're you're publicly pledging uh, to God uh, and your commitment to Him, and then we just got to live it out. And it's not about us being perfect, but it is all about Him who who brought us. Uh, to himself uh, by suffering and dying on the cross. And I think Peter's reminding ourselves of that. Uh, right. Um, well, thank you, Chris, for, 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 for your stories. Uh, and and um, I appreciate your honesty here. Uh, it's just, um, again, I have different people on because we went through different things. Um, you know, like you guys grew up in Howard County. I grew up in Montgomery County. Chris grew up in Frederick County. Like, you know, just... And all, even though it's close, it's still different time periods and different experiences. But yet, it's one truth that that is Jesus is the gospel, and we're trying to just obey and, and trying to um, you know just continue after Him. And so uh, that's why I have all these teachers on uh, to give their perspective. Let me close in prayer, and we'll end our time. Let's pray, Father. We thank you uh, for you. We thank you for the cross. We thank you uh, for the truth uh, that is outlined here. Uh, that you are the one who, who brought us to yourself, that you are the one who traded your perfection and righteousness for us and our dirtiness, Lord. And we praise you for it. We thank you for uh, the, the sign of baptism, that what a wonderful thing that, that we can do it um, to see uh, a visual um, thing of, of your promise of, uh, that is enacted in our lives as we a uh, pledge to you, uh, Ian, and thank you for your grace that even though we pledge to you, we, we fail all the time, and yet um, you still keep us, and you still love us, and we praise you for that. Pray for my high school students. I pray that they're doing well during this pandemic, that you are with them. Help them to finish uh, strong uh, this final year. Uh, all those who are not see graduating seniors, uh, may they just endure to the end, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.